Hi everybody, welcome back. It's good to see you. I'm Professor Pastor Paul and this is the Midweek Bible Festival. We're in the month of July here and that means that we are doing the Book of Job. Started off last week, you may remember. Did a little bit of Job, gave you some background information on it. I'm not going to repeat all of that right here, but I'm going to make a few points that are particularly important for what we're going to do today. Okay, Book of Job. That's our deal this month, and this is our second installment out of four. First thing to remember is that this is wisdom literature. Okay, it's not part of Israel's narrative. It's not part of its story in the sense that, that Genesis and Exodus, you know, and Judges and um, Kings and all that are part of the story, nor is it prophecy. Okay. It's not a book of prophecy either. It's what's known as a wisdom book. It's wisdom literature. It's not about Israel's story so much, historical, you know, story so much as it is um, sort of um, about how to live. It's kind of pragmatic that way. In most of the Bible, this is important from last week, and it's very important for, our, for, for what we're going to do today. Most of the Bible, the Old Testament, I'll put it that way. Most of the Old Testament is based on the idea that if you do good things, then good things will come to you. It's based on the idea that if A, then A. And if you do bad things, then bad things will come to you. Okay, we all kind of believe that in general. Okay, that's not exactly radical. In fact, it's what I would call standard wisdom. Right? Do good things, and good things will come to you. Uh, if A, then A. Let me adjust this camera just a little bit. This is bugging me just a little bit here. Bear with me. There you go. That's better. Okay. So... Standard wisdom is if A, then A. If you do good things, good things will happen. And this is shown not only in, say, the wisdom book of Proverbs, but also in the arc of the story itself, right? The prophets are always getting on to Israel, telling them that the reason they're suffering, uh, the reason for the exile, for example, Babylonian exile, is because Israel disobeyed God. Bad thing, do bad things, good things happen, but you stick to the covenant, uh, act in accordance with the ways of Yahweh, and things will go better for you, right? So, if you do good, you get good. Very simple, okay? Also, I mentioned that uh, the book of Job is a story itself, but it's not set within Israel's narrative. Uh, neither Job nor any of the other players in the story are, Isra are Israelites, it's not set in any particular time. It's not set in Israel. Okay, It's set in the land of Uz, which is Lord knows where. The point of all this, of course, was to remind you that the story is not so much about the historical details, but about the story itself. The book is about the story itself. Okay, I called it last week, Israel Goes to the Theater. Okay, So this is like going to the theater, and it's a story... It's kind of out of out of uh, out of time. You know, it's not in a particular time. It's not in a particular place. And another point of that is that the story is really universal. Okay, it's a story that everybody can relate to. Okay, it's not particular to Israel. In fact, stories like Job show up in all kinds of ancient literature, not just the literature of Israel. Um, Again, the point of that is to remove the to to remove distractions and to put the emphasis on the story itself and on the questions it raises. And here are the questions that it raises, which I mentioned last week, and which we're going to bring up again very soon. Number one: Is God just? Is God just? We like to think God is just, right? But the story uh, draws that belief, that assumption into question. And a second question, which is like the first one, is does God operate the universe in strict accordance with the idea of justice? Okay, so 
God could be just, but maybe God doesn't operate the universe according to that principle. Okay, so just because God is just does not mean that God necessarily must uh, operate the universe in strict accordance to the principle of justice. So is God just? Does God operate the universe uh, in strict accordance with justice? And uh, number three, if God does operate the universe with, in strict accordance to the principle of justice, why do people suffer? In particular, why does Job suffer? Those are the questions that are out there. Is God just? Does God operate the universe according to justice? And if so, how can we explain Job's suffering? Okay. Now, this week we start with chapter one. Oh, I want to remind you of this too. The book is structured. First two chapters, okay, uh, are written in prose, just, you know, paragraphs, storytelling. The last book, chapter 42, is also written in prose with the same language and the same style as the first two. And all of the intermediate, I guess, 38 chapters are, yeah, 39 chapters are, um, they are uh, poetry. Okay. Kind of complex Hebrew poetry. So we're going to look at those first two chapters. We may get a little bit into the poetry, but we're going to start with the first two chapters that are all in prose. All right. Job 1 and 2. Here's what we get. Job. The curtain rises on Job. It's a sunny day. Our hero is a good guy. And remember this. Job and everybody in the book assumes that standard wisdom holds. The standard wisdom, again, being, as I said a moment ago, if you do good, you get good. If A, then A. If you do bad, you get bad. If A, then A. So, if Job's a good guy, and he is described as good, blameless and upright, he fears God, turns away from evil. Blameless and upright, turns away from evil, fears God. And that phrase, fears God, is the essence of traditional wisdom. If you want to talk about Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, which is standard wisdom condensed, the shortest summary that you can come up with for the book of Proverbs is the fear of the Lord is the path to wisdom. Fear of the Lord. If you fear God in the sense of awe, in the sense of respect, not so much in the sense of I'm running and hiding. You fear God, it's the beginning of wisdom. Job fears God. In other words, he does all the stuff he's supposed to, according to the traditional wisdom. He fears God. He's blameless and upright, and he's a good guy. So in accordance to traditional wisdom, he's not only a good guy, but he's a rich guy. He is set up. Now, at the time, there was no afterlife. There was no reward in heaven. Basically, sort of an idea of the underworld, sort of a shadowy place where everybody goes, regardless of how good or bad they've been up here on the surface of the planet, right? They, they go down to the underworld, that's it. So, any reward you might get is not in the afterworld or in the other life or some beatific vision, right? It's any, any reward you get is in terms of prosperity. So, Job has prospered. Why? Because he's good. Blameless and upright fears, the God, fears God. Therefore, he's rich. He is the greatest of the men of the East, says Job 1. Actually, the greatest of the people of the East. I think that's how, the, how it's actually said. He has seven sons and three daughters. Big family. That's the kind of reward I'm talking about. If you're a good guy, if you're a good person, you get rewards. Not some by and by, but right here and now, in this life. And he's gotten them. 
seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and very many servants. So he's been hugely rewarded. Why? Because he's been hugely good. It describes him in, in, in Job 1. He's very pious. He prays for his children. He loves his children. He prays for his children. He is outwardly very compassionate. Okay. 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys. So pretty much in any way that wealth was counted at, at the time, he's got it. Okay. So here we have Job. Good guy. Righteous guy. Wealthy guy in accordance with the traditional wisdom. So that's our setup. Actually, our setup, that, that, that's, that's, the, that, that, that's the first part of our setup. The second part of the setup, all of a sudden we cut to heaven. The heavenly court. Okay. God is talking to the sons of God. Now, who are they? God is sitting on God's throne, looking out, holding, holding court. And around him are the sons of God. And these are beings which are sort of like, um, you know, sort of, sort of uh, maybe kind of like angels, but they're not angels like you read about later in Scripture. Um, but they're definitely heavenly beings who are part of the heavenly court. It's not just God up there all by, all by himself. It's God with a whole host of helpers, in a sense, a whole host of heavenly beings that attend to God up there in the heavenly court. Sort of a, sort of a holy command center. Okay, Sons of God are all there. And one of these sons of God is known as Hasatan, or the Satan. It's where, it's where our Satan came from. It's where our idea of Satan came from. From this guy. But in Old Testament, he's not Satan. He's a full blown member in, 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 in good standing in the heavenly court, Hasatan. And so the Lord talks to Hasatan and says, Hasatan, what's up? Where you been? What you been up to? Hasatan says, I, This is what he does. This is what he tells God. He says, I've been walking across the earth to and fro upon it. So Hasatan's been down here, walking around. Now, what his role is, Hasatan, what does that mean? It means the accuser. Hasatan is essentially a, um, you know, like a divine prosecuting attorney. Walks to and fro upon the earth, seeking out iniquity. That's Hasatan's job. He's really good at it. So he tells God, that's what I've been doing, walking up and down to and fro upon the earth, searching out iniquity. The accuser. And God says, hey, accuser, have you considered my servant Job? God brings Job up. The accuser doesn't. The accuser would have gone on his merry way. But no, God says, have you considered my servant Job? Blameless and upright. And the accuser just sort of snickers. Ha <laughs> ha Laughs. Says, God, you know what? The reason why he's so good, the reason why Job is so good and so blameless and upright is because you keep on rewarding him for being so good. His virtue is motivated. It's not disinterested, says the accuser. Job's goodness, his virtue is not disinterested. 
It's not virtue for its own sake. It's virtue because when Job does good, you give him nice stuff like all these beautiful children and all these donkeys and all these oxen and all these sheep and all these servants and all this money. I'd be good too, he seems to say, if that's what it got me. But according to this traditional wisdom, reward and punishment thing, if A, then A, if you do good, you get good. That's what's going on here. You're just, you're just feeding the cycle. He's not good because he wants to be good. He's good because he gets something out of it. That's what Hasatan, that's what the accuser Hasatan says to the Lord. And the Lord says, you know what? It's not true. He's a good man. His goodness is disinterested. It's not just about what he gets from it. And God says, I'll tell you what. To show you that I'm right, to prove that I'm right, I'll let you take away his stuff. Kill his children. Go on. Don't hurt him. But have at his life and all the stuff that you think is keeping him in line. And you'll see, he will not curse me, God says. He will not curse me. He will stand virtuous, blameless and upright, even when all his stuff and even when all his children, all ten of them, are taken away. And so the accuser leaves the Lord and heads down to earth to destroy Job's life. Now, we'll time out here. This is a preposterous setup. I'm just going to tell you. Why would God do that? Why would God let it be? Why would God let Hasatan, this accuser guy, destroy Job's life? I don't know. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. And I don't know. Maybe, you know, this is written this way just to leave that mystery hanging out there. We don't know why God allows it. You know? Uh, we don't know why God made that decision. It just sounds like he's just making a bet. Right? He's making a tough guy bet. Oh, yeah, you think, you, you think you're right. I'm going to prove to you that you're wrong, accuser. You go ahead and have your way with this guy. Uh, but don't kill him, because if you kill him, we'll never know who won the bet. It's kind of weird, right? I don't like it. I'm not going to explain it. But it's in there, and we're going to move forward, not knowing why God did it. Okay? Cut back down to earth where the accuser has his way with Job's stuff and Job's children. Job's hanging out, back down there on the earth. One of his servants comes up. Oh, sir, foreigners have carried off your oxen and your donkeys, and they've killed a bunch of your servants with the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So, oxen, donkeys, gone. Bunch of servants, gone. Job, whoa, no. Bad news. And then another servant runs up to Job. Fire has fallen from heaven and consumed your sheep. How do you like that? Fire, fall from heaven, consume your sheep. And killed a bunch of your servants with a sword. More servants killed with a sword. And I alone, the second servant says, have escaped to tell you. So that's two servants now who have escaped to tell Job the bad news. No, no, says Job. Not good. And then at that point, a third, that's right, a third servant comes up. It says, the Chaldeans showed up, Job, and they stole all your camels and your sheep. No, just your camels. Right. Sheep have already been taken off. Sheep were already burned up by fire from heaven. But the Chaldeans came around and carried off all the camels. 3,000 camels, gone. And also, a bunch more of your servants killed with the edge of the sword, and I alone, the third servant to say, I alone have escaped to tell you. 
no, no, says Job. And then the fourth servant comes up to Job. A great wind blew across the desert, collapsed your children's house, your son's house, your oldest child's house. It fell on top of all ten of your children. They are all dead. And, and also, uh, I, only I alone have escaped to tell you. All this happens within a very short span of time. To Job you know, has lost all of his wealth and his children. He moans. He tears his clothes and says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. But he also adds to that, Blessed be the name of the Lord. So he sings God's praises even in the midst of loss. Great loss. All ten children who he loved. He was not an absentee father. He was in their lives. He was present to them. And they're gone. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Cut back up to heaven. Again, God's holding court with all of the heavenly beings, the sons of God, so they're called. And again, he asks the accuser, where have you been? Same dialogue as before. Up and down, to and fro upon the earth, walking upon it. God says, have you considered my servant Job? Look at Job. Hey, he didn't curse my name. In fact, he's still singing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the accuser's like, oh, come on. Skin for skin, God. Anybody will be okay until you start to hurt them physically, their health. Get, let me let me let me get make him sick on top of this, says the accuser, and then you'll see he'll curse your name. God says, nope, not gonna happen. You do it and let's find out. Let's do the experiment. But again, do not touch, do not hurt him, do, 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 do not kill him. Because if you kill him, we'll never know how the, how the experiment comes out. Again, completely preposterous. Spare his life. So Job gives, I mean, so the accuser takes off, goes back down to the earth, and afflicts Job with horrible, horrible sores from the tip of the top of his head to the soles of his feet. His body is covered in these terrible boils and sores, and he's just a loathsome sight. Terrible sight. He's ill. And he sits himself down on the ash heap outside the city where all the garbage goes, gets burned. He sits down on the ash heap, starts using parts of broken pottery to pick at his sores. He's lost everything. His wife says, curse God and die. But Job retains his calm demeanor. He does not curse God. He sits down on the ash heap and grieves his enormous losses. At this point, three people show up to attend to their friend Job. These are friends of Job. Again, these are not Israelites. Eliphaz the Timonite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite. These three folks, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, sit down with Job, and for seven days, they mourn with Job in silence, as good friends do. Sit, be present, in silence, letting Job know in his loss in his grief, he is not alone. And that is where chapter 2 ends. The man has lost so much. Is God just? Does God run the universe on strictly in accordance with the principle of justice? And finally, if God does operate the universe according to justice, how do we explain Job's suffering? Remember, 
he is innocent. He is upright and blameless. Yet he has suffered more than anybody. He was given more than anybody because he was better than everybody else. He was so good. He was so upright and so blameless. He feared God. He turned away evil and was given so much because he was so good. If A, then A. But now, all that's gone. So our formula, it spreads not only throughout the wisdom literature, but throughout the whole Old Testament. If A, then A is questioned, because what we have now is a situation of if A, then not A, then something else. In fact, now we're in a situation of if A, then negative A. It's like, he was the best, but he got the worst. The old wisdom is being questioned. And next week, we'll look at the poetry. What happens when, after a full week of being silent, Job finally opens his mouth. Look forward to it. Hope you have a good week. Love you all. See you then. Bye-bye.